Background of Existentialism Modern existential psychology has roots in the writings of Sven Kierkegaard, Danish philosopher and theologian. Kierkegaard was concerned with the increasing trend in post-industrial societies toward the dehumanization of people. He opposed any attempt to see people merely as objects, but at the same time, he opposed the view that subjective perceptions are one's only reality. Instead, Kierkegaard was concerned with both the experiencing person and the person's experience. He wished to understand people as they exist in the world as thinking, active, and willing beings. As May put it, Kierkegaard sought to overcome the dichotomy of reason and emotion by turning people's attentions to the reality of the immediate experience which underlies both subjectivity and objectivity. Kierkegaard, like later existentialists, emphasized a balance between freedom and responsibility. People acquire freedom of action through expanding their self-awareness and then by assuming responsibility for their actions. The acquisition of freedom and responsibility, however, is achieved only at the expense of anxiety. As people realize that, ultimately, they are in charge of their own destiny, they experience the burden of freedom and the pain of responsibility. Kierkegaard's views had little effect on philosophical thought during his comparatively short lifetime, he died at age 42, but the work of two German philosophers, Friedrich Nietzsche and Martin Heidegger, helped popularize existential philosophy during the 20th century. Heidegger exerted considerable influence on two Swiss psychiatrists, Ludwig Binswanger and Mehdi Boss. Binswanger and Boss, along with Karl Jaspers, Viktor Frankl, and others, adapted the philosophy of existentialism to the practice of psychotherapy. Existentialism also permeated 20th century literature through the work of the French writer Jean Paul Sartre and the French Algerian novelist Albert Camus, religion through the writings of Martin Buber, Paul Tillich, and others, and the world of art through the work of Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso, whose paintings break through the boundaries of realism and demonstrate a freedom of being rather than the freedom of doing. After World War II, European existentialism in its various forms spread to the United States and became even more diversified as it was taken up by an assorted collection of writers, artists, dissidents, college professors, and students, playwrights, clergy, and others. What is existentialism? Although philosophers and psychologists interpret existentialism in a variety of ways, some common elements are found among most existential thinkers. First, existence takes precedence over essence. Existence means to emerge or to become, essence implies a static immutable substance. Existence suggests process, essence refers to a product. Existence is associated with growth and change, essence signifies stagnation and finality. Western civilization, and particularly Western science, has traditionally valued essence over existence. It has sought to understand the essential composition of things, including humans. By contrast, existentialists affirm that people's essence is their power to continually redefine themselves through the choices they make. Second, existentialism opposes the split between subject and object. According to Kierkegaard, people are more than mere cogs in the machinery of an industrialized society, but they are also more than subjective thinking beings living passively through armchair speculation. Instead, people are both subjective and objective and must search for truth by living active and authentic lives. Third, people search for some meaning to their lives. They ask, though not always consciously, the important questions concerning their being, who am I? Is life worth living? Does it have a meaning? How can I realize my humanity? Fourth, existentialists hold that ultimately each of us is responsible for who we are and what we become. We cannot blame parents, teachers, employers, God, or circumstances. As Sartre said, man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. Such is the first principle of existentialism. Although we may associate with others in productive and healthy relationships, in the end, we are each alone. We can choose to become what we can be or we can choose to avoid commitment and choice, but ultimately, it is our choice. Fifth, existentialists are basically anti-theoretical. 
to them, theories further dehumanize people and render them as objects. As we mentioned in Chapter 1, theories are constructed in part to explain phenomena. Existentialists are generally opposed to this approach. Authentic experience takes precedence over artificial explanations. When experiences are molded into some pre-existing theoretical model, they lose their authenticity and become divorced from the individual who experienced them. Basic concepts before proceeding to Rollo May's view of humanity, we pause to look at two basic concepts of existentialism, namely, being in the world and non-being. Being in the world. Existentialists adopt a phenomenological approach to understanding humanity. To them, we exist in a world that can be best understood from our own perspective. When scientists study people from an external frame of reference, they violate both the subjects and their existential world. The basic unity of person and environment is expressed in the German word Dasein, meaning to exist there. Hence, Dasein literally means to exist in the world and is generally written as being in the world. The hyphens in this term imply a oneness of subject and object, of person and world. Many people suffer from anxiety and despair brought on by their alienation from themselves or from their world. They either have no clear image of themselves or they feel isolated from a world that seems distant and foreign. They have no sense of Dasein, no unity of self and world. As people strive to gain power over nature, they lose touch with their relationship to the natural world. As they come to rely on the products of the Industrial Revolution, they become more alienated from the stars, the soil, and the sea. Alienation from the world includes being out of touch with one's own body as well. Recall that Rollo May began his recovery from tuberculosis only after realizing that it was he who had the illness. This feeling of isolation and alienation of self from the world is suffered not only by pathologically disturbed individuals but also by most individuals in modern societies. Alienation is the illness of our time, and it manifests itself in three areas, 1, separation from nature, 2, lack of meaningful interpersonal relations, and, 3, alienation from one's authentic self. Thus, people experience three simultaneous modes in their being in the world, umwelt, or the environment around us, mitwelt, or our relations with other people, and eigenwelt, or our relationship with ourself. Ernwelt is the world of objects and things and would exist even if people had no awareness. It is the world of nature and natural law and includes biological drives, such as hunger and sleep, and such natural phenomena as birth and death. We cannot escape Ernwelt, we must learn to live in the world around us and to adjust to changes within this world. Freud's theory, with its emphasis on biology and instincts, deals mostly with Ernwelt. But we do not live only in Ernwelt. We also live in the world with people, that is, Mitwelt. We must relate to people as people, not as things. If we treat people as objects, then we are living solely in Ernwelt. The difference between Ernwelt and Mitwelt can be seen by contrasting sex with love. If a person uses another as an instrument for sexual gratification, then that person is living in Ernwelt at least in his or her relationship to that other person. However, love demands that one make a commitment to the other person. Love means respect for that other person's being in the world, an unconditional acceptance of that person. Not every mitwelt relationship, however, necessitates love. The essential criterion is that the dossier of the other person is respected. The theories of Sullivan and Rogers, with their emphasis on interpersonal relations, deal mostly with Mitwelt. Eigenwelt refers to one's relationship with oneself. It is a world not usually explored by personality theorists. To live in Eigenwelt means to be aware of oneself as a human being and to grasp who we are as we relate to the world of things and to the world of people. What does this sunset mean to me? How is this other person a part of my life? What characteristics of mine allow me to love this person? How do I perceive this experience? Healthy people live in Ernwelt, Mitwelt, and Eigenwelt simultaneously. They adapt to the natural world, relate to others as humans, and have a keen awareness of what all these experiences mean to them. 
non-being. Being in the world necessitates an awareness of self as a living, emerging being. This awareness, in turn, leads to the dread of not being, that is, non-being or nothingness. May wrote that to grasp what it means to exist, one needs to grasp the fact that he might not exist, that he treads at every moment on the sharp edge of possible annihilation and can never escape the fact that death will arrive at some unknown moment in the future. Death is not the only avenue of non-being, but it is the most obvious one. Life becomes more vital, more meaningful when we confront the possibility of our death. Nearly 40 years before his own death, May spoke of death as the one fact of my life which is not relative but absolute, and my awareness of this gives my existence and what I do each how an absolute quality. When we do not courageously confront our non-being by contemplating death, we nevertheless will experience non-being in other forms, including addiction to alcohol or other drugs, promiscuous sexual activity, and other compulsive behaviors. Our non-being can also be expressed as blind conformity to society's expectations or as generalized hostility that pervades our relations to others. The fear of death or non-being often provokes us to live defensively and to receive less from life than if we would confront the issue of our non-existence. As May said, we are afraid of non-being and so we shrivel up our being. We flee from making active choices, that is, we make choices without considering who we are and what we want. We may try to avoid the dread of non-being by dimming our self-awareness and denying our individuality, but such choices leave us with feelings of despair and emptiness. Thus, we escape the dread of non-being at the expense of a constricted existence. A healthier alternative is to face the inevitability of death and to realize that non-being is an inseparable part of being.